My name is Darlene Cavalier, and um, I'm the founder of SciStarter, so I'm going to talk about citizen science, and how I came to find citizen science is how many people find citizen science. For me, I had no uh, real interest in science. I certainly did not have a background in science, although I was working for the Walt Disney Company, which owned Discover Magazine. So after working there for about 10 years in business development, um, I started to question some of the uh, statements that we were making in terms of science is for everyone. I did become a little bit more interested in science after working at Discover Magazine, and I wasn't unlike Discover as back then, about seven and a half million readers. Seven and a half million readers, most of whom do not have a science degree, would pay money to read this magazine about science. And we constantly talked about the fact that science was for everyone, and we meant that as a consumer of the information. It was actually really, really difficult to find examples of how you might be able to influence or shape science without having a science degree or being involved in uh, policy making or going to school to be an educator. And I fit in that other category like most of Discover's mag magazine readers. So I decided to um, go to school. I went to graduate school to learn more about people like me. How do you, have a, how do you not have a formal science degree and end up shaping some fields of science. So this was at Penn, and I quickly started discovering um, the term citizen science was not really used then. Um, it was environmental monitoring people, advocates. Um, oh, I forget what else they called them, but lots of, lots of different terminologies. And it was also very, very difficult to find opportunities to engage. So I loved learning that they were out there. They were just scattered all over the place. So as a means to an end, I put together a small database of what we call now citizen science projects. And I made that open, just asking people to add projects that they knew about and also tagging them in ways that I can let my friends and family know about projects they might be interested in. Years later, that would become SciStarter. And let's see here. A little background on citizen science, although I know this is, you guys are way above this, but in terms of your knowledge, but take a look. This is a, a PBS television series that's out now, all about citizen science, called The Crowd in the Cloud. They produced this. And it's basically just giving you an overview of the types of people that do citizen science. They're all types of people, hunter, hunters, fishermen, you name them. People who are motivated because they have a health issue, like Dana described earlier. People who are just generally curious. Um, they might be your amateur astronomers. People who love nature. They want to do things with their kids and their family. So many different reasons that people get involved in citizen science. And it's one lesson that I've learned. Lots of different reasons, lots of different types of people, so many different types of projects. We have at least 1,500 projects registered on SciStarter now. This is a place where people go to find an opportunity to engage, and we try to make it easy for them. We can let you know about things you can do while you're fishing, um, things you can do with kids, all those different demographics that I described before. Um, it's a canonical source of project metadata, which means we push and pull. We have APIs that we share um, data records with Australia, many different countries, the federal government, and so forth. Um, and we also have APIs where we share the project database with PBS and Discover Magazine and lots of other places so people can stumble upon these opportunities while they're doing something else. So many people are involved in citizen science projects already. These three happen to be the most popular categories. Um, bird watching, this 1.5 million reports. Is anybody here involved or submit data to eBird? 1.5 million reports came in in January alone. That's a lot of bird watching happening out there. An estimated 1.5 million people in the United States monitor uh, the nation's river, streams, and lakes. Lots and lots of people involved in that. Wrought with um, some, some gaps that present really neat opportunities as well, the main being instrumentation and lack of access to uh, proper in instruments for that. Definitely, citizen science is serious science. There are so many examples, and this is usually the question that comes up from professional researchers and even potential citizen scientists themselves who don't feel confident in submitting data because they're so worried they're going to screw something up. Well-designed projects with very clear protocols, um, accessible um, instruments, and some feedback from the, from the project leader 
all lead to very good data coming in. These are just fun facts that we don't usually see with citizen science outcomes of what happens. Um, the bacteria in your belly button was because citizen scientists swabbed their belly button and, and sent their microbes into NC State University where they sequenced them and found out that at least 50 different types of bacteria live in your belly button. This is a great example too of how cit citizen science can accelerate research. Um, this is something called Cell Slider from U um, let's see, Cancer Research UK. They ran this as an experiment. They wanted to test if the data coming from the volunteers was as accurate as what their professional researchers were um, providing, and they wanted to see how much time it might save. And in this case, um, volunteers would look at images of, of cancerous cells. And it was very clear protocols in terms of, here's, how you, here's what you're looking for. If you see this type of cluster, you annotate files, is what you're doing. And they stopped this when they realized that in three months, the volunteers did as much of the classification as their professional scientists could do in 18 months, and it was as accurate. So they actually rolled this out and invested a lot more money in making this a gamified approach too. Um, somebody took the time to go ahead and quantify the economic value of this uh, from the University of Washington and found in a study of 338 uh, citizen science projects, mostly um, ecology-based projects, between 1.3 and 2.3 million volunteers, these are the citizen scientists, had an economic value of $2.5 billion. So huge cost savings. So now we know, God bless you, that because of citizen scientists, we have, um, they produce accurate data, they accelerate research, they have a econo positive economic impact, and we now know that there is a learning curve. They are learning more about science and technology in doing this. This is just registered users on SciStarter. So we have more than 75,000 people who are a part of our community. Um, they're all over the world. So many different types of projects. We have such rich meta metadata in SciStarter that we can start to break this out. And not surprisingly, lots of different types of volunteers. Um, and what we don't know yet, although we're trying to study this now, um, is how often people move between these categories we know at the very bottom there, you can see Taylor there. She's what we call a toe dipper, and this was based on um, uh, time we spent with NSF i -Corps. So if anybody has an uh, NSF grant, I would totally encourage you to do this program. It was spent six weeks, it's basically an incubator, and we had a lot of time to validate some of the hypotheses that we've had. And one was just to understand who gets involved in these projects, and they uh, encourage you to look for business opportunities too. So uh, Taylor was interesting, this type of demographic, because She'll try many different types of projects, and convenience is key for her. So this might be a, a dog walker who said, sure, I'll contribute while I'm out on my walk. Um, just make it easy for me. And I'll even be willing to invest in the instruments needed for those projects, and many do require some level of instrumentation. Um, by the way, on average, they're willing to pay $20 per project for the instruments. Um, the next one is very typical. People do between three and five projects. When they're involved in one, we find that they're involved in between three and five at about that same time frame, so within a given year. And in that case, that's a $100 customer for anybody looking to monetize their work or look for means of sustainability beyond grants. Something to consider. Then you have the extremely important role of the facilitator, who we're starting to learn more and more about. Without a facilitator, many projects fail, and the experience of the volunteer is, is not fulfilling. They expect to get involved for social connection as well, and too often the projects are extremely isolating. So having that facilitator just kind of almost like that bear hug that Dana gave the example of. It's sort of your bear hug. It's your encourager and your, your cheerleader along the way. Then you have the people that you're probably most used to working with. Those are the people at the top. They are driven. Nothing stops them. They figure out a way to lower every barrier in front of them, and they make amazing things happen. So um, we are, uh, I guess, taking a page from what Tom suggested earlier and putting something in writing and hoping it happens. Solutions Lab is an idea, at least at Arizona State University, where I'm a professor of practice in the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Because of where we're positioned, we're able to see lots and lots of these barriers and wonder what we can do to minimize the pain points for the people coming through that pathway. Um, we definitely know that access to the instruments is a major problem. 
even just knowing what instrument to choose for their project is a problem for the project owner and the scientists. They're often not aware of the low cost versions of their tools that exist out there. So helping them find each other would be cool. Um, understanding how to bundle the projects and all the instruments that would be needed for those projects for those people who do to three to five anyway. What they asked is um, us having a thousand more projects in our database is not helpful to somebody looking for one, for example. So being able to curate and recommend projects would be great. Um, access to the tools is half the equation. Understanding um, if that tool was validated and reviewed in some way is another gap that we see that somebody should step in, a third party validation there. And combining baby steps we're starting to see towards combining the do-it-yourselfers and the makers with the citizen science community. It'd be great to see a more active approach there. Um, I'm also involved in something called eCast, and a lot of this was informed by Beth's earlier work too. And this is ways to get people involved in um, participatory technology assessment. And so I would encourage you, if you're interested in citizen science moving towards influencing policy, to look at eCastNetwork.org. Um, and so what we're starting to do here is be able to see if we can uh, broaden the spectrum of opportunities for citizen scientists to include policy making, maybe at one end, and the ability to be involved in helping to shape and design some of the instruments that are needed for the projects too. And that's it. And this is a this is a fun picture because we have the eclipse coming up. So if you happen to be traveling somewhere where you'd be in the path of that, there's a very, very cool citizen science project called the Eclipse Mega Movie that you can find on SciStarter. So consider getting involved in that August 21st. Thank you.